Good morning, John Schaefer. Dr. John Schaefer is with us this morning on Cheers to Your Health. And Dr. Schaefer is a neurologist, and I have known him for almost 45 years. He was a marvelous volunteer for the American Heart Association. And we wanted to talk a little bit this morning, John, about why you chose neurology as your focus area, and also some of the diseases that fall under neurology and some of your really creative ideas at addressing and helping people that have MS and other neurological disorders. So welcome, and we're um, thrilled to have you here. And um, please tell me where you went to school, where you were born, and how things unfolded. Well, thank you, Diane. This is a, an amazing project that you're involved in and those questions that you just asked. Uh, do we have like four or five hours to... Uh, we can to extend, answer? exactly. We well, might have we'll a few see. days. <laughs> so, so you're right. Yeah, you and I have known each other for a very long time. And in fact, you're responsible for, uh, for much of my uh, career and where it ended up. Uh, uh, I just retired, in fact, a month ago. And so... Uh, it has been after a long career. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin and in Illinois, and I went to medical school at the University of Chicago, and I did some uh, medicine internship and residency there. And then I uh, came to San Francisco to, uh, uh, for my neurology training. And, uh, and, uh, and after uh, three years at UCSF for neurology, spent two years in the Navy at the Oakland Naval Hospital and then came to Sacramento after that and, uh, and have been in practice in Sacramento uh, since that time, up until a month ago. <laughs> and uh, how did, uh, you asked me prior to this, so how did I pick neurology? And I think that, you know, even when I was in high school and I was doing science projects that involved nerve transmission and muscle contraction and things, and you know, which is kind of related to neurology. And uh, I think it's really difficult for, you know, wh why did anyone pick a particular specialty? I've always been amazed at specialties that people pick and wondered why they would ever be interested in something like that. But uh, but neurology is, is, is fascinating, how the brain works and, and the spinal cord and the nerves and and, uh, you know, is extremely mysterious. And, and there's still so much that we don't understand about brain function. Uh, so it certainly is a challenge. The, uh, there are many disorders that affect the way the brain and the, uh, and the nervous system work. And uh, you mentioned, you know, what kinds of disorders are there. Uh, there's a myriad of disorders uh, ranging from... Uh, Problems in which the nervous system doesn't develop properly when uh, you know uh, the organism is being formed to uh, <clears throat> paroxysmal things that is sudden things that happen during the course of one's life things like strokes where a blood clot can suddenly block off uh, you know an important part of the brain or trauma certainly uh, and then there's a, a range of uh, conditions that are caused by inflammation and, you know, of common one of those is multiple sclerosis in which uh, the immune system attacks the insulating material on the nerves in the brain and in the spinal cord. And, um, and then, of course, there's trauma. Uh, head injuries and spinal cord injuries are uh, an important uh, uh, type of disability that we see today. And then uh, finally, in later stages of life, there's a whole group of neurologic disorders that are referred to as degenerative disorders, which is just parts of the brain, uh, you know, getting too old or, or not, not working properly. And those include things like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease and, and, uh, and a variety of others. Uh, so, uh, it is uh, something that covers the whole lifespan, and uh, you know all of these, as I say, are uh, you know part of the the mysteries of how the brain works. Right, exactly. You know, I've been um, kind of looking at neurological diseases, and frankly, 
partially because I've known you. And so I've been kind of like uh, looking out there. And then a, a member of my own family was um, diagnosed with MS and you were extremely helpful. One of the things I'm wondering is it seems to me that neurological disorders seem to hit women the hardest and also um, women of Celt background or women in the northern areas of the globe, like uh, England, Ireland, the Scandinavian countries. Is that true? Well, what you're seeing is true of multiple sclerosis. Uh, it's not true of neurologic disorders in general. Uh, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease uh, have different predilections, but uh, but multiple sclerosis is uh, there's three or four times as many women as men who are afflicted with multiple sclerosis, and it is uh, something that uh, of, of Northern European and Scandinavian heritage are. Uh, have a higher risk of, of developing multiple sclerosis, and you know probably for a lot of reasons, right. genes being uh, one of those. Right. Uh, yeah, I've heard that. Like, even if you have just a kind of a little bit of maybe Latin blood, Italian or French, or that you, it's not you don't get it as often. And uh, you know that was just an amazing thing to me that it is kind of geographically focused. Uh. Yeah, yeah. To, to, to an extent that's true. There are multiple sclerosis is not generally considered to be a genetic disorder. When we talk about genetic disorders, we usually talk about things like Huntington's disease, for example, where there is a gene. And if you have that gene, then you have Huntington's disease. And if you don't have that gene, you don't have Huntington's disease. And... Uh, uh, and many disorders uh, that we know of today are are multi uh, genetic, uh, in, in that there are many many genes, uh, uh, and multiple sclerosis is one of those. That there's <clears throat> there's over 200 genes that are more common in a group of people with MS than in the general population, but not. Uh, enough that you could say that any one of those is the cause of MS. But so I think that that's where a lot of the ethnic uh, uh, issues come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's been kind of a surprise for me. You know, I've watched your career too in Northern California and have noticed that, you know, wherever you are, John, you seem to be doing something to help, especially people with MS. Could you talk a little bit about? the programs, some of the programs that you've started that are continuing? Well, I think that, uh, um, you know, neurology has become subspecialized. Uh, when I finished my residency, which was in the 1970s, I felt like I was an expert on everything neurological, whether it's migraine headaches or, or pinched nerves or Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. And, and, uh, through the years, you know, uh, there have been so many developments and new treatments and new ways of diagnosing all of these things that that now uh, many of us end up specializing in one particular area. And, uh, uh, you know, my interests have been, well, you you got me interested in stroke years ago through uh, when you were with the American Heart Association. And then uh, more recently, it's been multiple sclerosis. But so I started the multiple sclerosis center uh, with Mercy Medical Group, Dignity Health, here in Sacramento, in about 2009. And it wasn't that we that we suddenly started. I mean, we'd always been doing that, but we sort of christened that as a as a, a center and developed then resources to support that. Uh, Nurses to help take who were specially trained in MS and and uh, educational programs, and then uh, I was very fortunate to have been approached by the Conrad Hilton Foundation or a, a person working with the Conrad Hilton Foundation uh, in 2013, actually, and and uh, and and asked whether I would be interested in applying for a grant for a wellness program. Mm -hmm such as one that Conrad Hilton Foundation had been uh, supporting at UCLA for quite a few years. 
And, uh, and I said yes, and, uh, and we got a very generous grant to get started and then some uh, additional grants to, to keep it going. But uh, so in 2014, the Multiple Sclerosis Achievement Center opened, and uh, uh, it consists of a, of a weekly program for people with disability for multiple sclerosis, and uh, it's a five-hour program. Uh, and uh, one day a week that includes uh, physical and cognitive and social and uh, and uh, activities and and it's and it's the the social aspect of it is absolutely amazing. I mean, it's a it's a uncommon enough disorder that uh, that many people with MS don't know anybody else with MS, and also. It affects young people and middle-aged people and and visible impairment. So when they're out in in public, uh, it, it's uh, uh, you know they have to. One one of the things people say when they come to this program is, I can come here and I don't have to explain anything to anybody. You know why I talk funny or why I walk funny or why I don't think as fast as as uh, as I should. Right, right. Yeah, I can see that that program would be absolutely marvelous for people who are um, suffering from MS. So is it like a daily program? Do they go daily? So the core program is one day a week for five hours. Now, this is pre-pandemic. Uh, it's it's been uh, modified during the pandemic, and uh, uh, so it's a kind of a, kind of a hybrid of virtual and in person. But uh, the the full original program is five hours uh, on one day a week, and actually there's one of the days has uh, two shorter programs that kind of overlap for people that that would not be physically able to uh, tolerate the, the full five hours. So. It's every week, but but the the connections that are made go uh, uh, every day. That uh, that people uh, yeah. uh, you know are in contact with each other and form friendships uh, outside of the group. There's also a support partners program, so that and that's such an important thing. Multiple sclerosis affects not just the person who has it, but their whole family and their relationships. And so uh, there's an ongoing program for the uh, the families uh, the, of, of people who have MS. And so lots of activities. There's about 100 people who are in the core program and then uh, in outreach programs. Uh, uh, and then there's also the, the, the MS Center itself uh, has a, a every other month a lecture series for the general public and for people with MS on you know aspects of MS. So yeah, a lot of activities. Wonderful. And the service that you are providing for these people, it's marvelous. We're going to take a little break now, and we will be back with Dr. John Schaefer talking about aspects of neurology on Cheers to Your Health. We're back with Dr. John Schaefer, and now we're going to talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease because we know a lot of people are dealing with family members and friends that have Alzheimer's. So, John, do you have any tips for people who have family members, who have friends, who are dealing with Alzheimer's? So Alzheimer's is a huge problem, and it's going to become even more huge as, as the population uh, ages. And uh, it's, it's really something that, that people are unprepared for, that is, families are, are unprepared for as as a family member develops Alzheimer's disease, uh, it comes on very slowly. Uh, it, uh, it extends over a period of years, and, uh, and family members may feel totally helpless uh, when, uh, when they experience this, not knowing what's going to happen. And there is enough variability from uh, one person to another that it is often hard to predict just how long is this going to go on and where is it going to end up? My advice to everybody is that uh, there are services that are available. There are uh, associations, the Alzheimer's Society and uh, uh, 
and uh, the uh, Del Oro Caregiver Center uh, are some examples of uh, organizations. And then there's support groups and things that I think are really, really important for people to participate in uh, just so that they, they get a better idea. When I have patients with, uh, with Alzheimer's, uh, I have in some cases connected family members from one patient uh, and, and, and another patient to, to, you know, where I can see their similarities in the patient that uh, it may be helpful to link with uh, somebody else that's been through it. Everybody's looking for a cure to Alzheimer's or a prevention. And, and so far, you know, we don't have it. We all read in the newspaper about exciting things that are happening, and there may be some inroads in, in, the, in the coming years, but I, I think that even those are, are going to be modest. Part of the problem is that the, the Alzheimer's process begins long before you even know that it's happening. And so with clinical trials and medications, you know, they take people who who have Alzheimer's disease and give them a medicine and see if it changes them. And it doesn't, but you know, perhaps we need to uh, be taking those medications when somebody's uh, in their twenties or their thirties before the process is even started uh, to see whether they actually have any long-term effect. Uh, and so, so that's, uh, but, but I think uh, getting support is just, so hugely important because it's a very, very rough road. I would think you'd feel isolated, you know, with a family member and not having dealt with Alzheimer's before, that boy, that it would um, really have some challenges. And so anything that is uh, helpful to people that are dealing with this, I think is good to know. Do How about things like how you kind of interact with a person that has Alzheimer's. I've heard various things. One thing I've heard is that you should not ask them a lot of questions. That like, the, do you remember questions? Is, have you heard that? You know, I, it's hard to generalize about that. People react very differently. A, a lot of uh, a lot of individuals with Alzheimer's don't believe that there's anything wrong with them, and it's the family member who's saying, "Hey, you know, this is not the person I married. You know, yeah. something's wrong with mom or dad or whatever." Whereas the affected person has no uh, recollection or no recognition of that, and so I think those people, when you when you're pushing them and poking them and testing them, you know, even within the family, that you know they don't they don't do well with that. Yeah. Of course, as a neurologist, I have to do that. I have to ask them questions and and go through uh, mental status examinations and things, which for some people are very very ignore uh, <laughs> the. the uh, uh, I remember, uh, you know, one of the, the mini mental status exam is a longstanding uh, instrument for testing because it, it gives you a score, and on the basis of that score, you can really characterize somebody. And one of them is, you know, write a sentence. You know, I tell you, you know, just write a sentence. You know, anything that you want to, you know, just just write it down. And, and so one woman, you know, uh, handed me her paper and it said, go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how, yeah. how many people react to it. But right. uh, and then I think that, you know, asking questions that that uh, a lot of times caregivers, especially children of, of, of parents who have Alzheimer's, you know, may kind of overdo the the testing, thinking that that maybe they're helping things that if I keep asking you, uh, you know, uh, questions of orientation or memory or that, that, uh, uh, that uh, it will help you in some way. And it may not. On the other hand, uh, people with, with, uh, with Alzheimer's and other kinds of dementia, what they lose is the, is the immediate memory. Uh, they can still remember where they went to third grade and who their junior high school, uh, teachers were and and uh and so sometimes that's soothing to go back into the uh memories from from years ago uh, uh when they can't remember what they had for breakfast uh, exactly. An hour ago. exactly is that a general could you say that that 
would be genuinely, genuinely accurate, that people would remember the past much more than what they did yesterday. Particularly in Alzheimer's disease, the problem is encoding new information in your brain. Uh, I've often explained to it as to patients is, you know, it's like you have a file cabinet and, and here you have a file of information that you want to use sometime in the future. So you open up the drawer and you put it in there and you close the drawer. And then at some future time when you need it, you open up the drawer and you pull it out. And what's, what's damaged in Alzheimer's is that process of putting it into the file cabinet. So stuff that's already in the file cabinet, you can access, you know, and that is the, the distant past memory, whereas, uh, uh, as they say, you know, what, what happened yesterday or what happened earlier today just didn't get uh, put in the file cabinet, didn't get encoded in the memory. Yeah, that's an excellent analogy. I mean, it really helps you understand what is uh, relevant and what may be forgotten. Exactly. exactly. Do you have any further advice for people regarding neurological diseases? If there was anything generally that you could say um, to help people who are listening? I think probably the most important thing uh, is to maintain good general health. Uh, Many of the neurologic disorders, including uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and including things like multiple sclerosis, you know, are worse if there's comorbidities. So if people are overweight or if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, that really compounds things. And so, uh, you know, there is no diet for Alzheimer's. There's no diet for Parkinson's or for multiple sclerosis, but, you know, heart healthy diets, you know, you, Diane, from your years with the American Heart Association know that, uh, uh, that heart healthy diets are good for the brain. Yeah. Exercise. Many, many studies have shown that exercise is good for the brain yeah. in all of these conditions. And so I think that that's, those are very important things. Smoking is 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 harmful to the brain and uh and it's best to not start at all and uh if for those who have started to uh uh to stop it and uh and hope that risk for strokes and heart attacks and multiple sclerosis which is affected by smoking uh can can eventually subside yeah no that's um absolutely true and in fact I was just listening this morning to a program that said that for um, those who have suffered the hardest from COVID-19, uh, they have been uh, statistically 80% have been either overweight, obese, or never getting proper exercise. I mean, 80%, that's, that's significant, you know? So uh, I agree with everything you say about taking care of your health all along the way. And I think that like sometimes um, we don't have the advantages that some countries do as far as having to walk. I mean, it, it seems like other countries walk, the people walk so much more than we do. We are very dependent on our vehicles. So if there are times they say that the 50s are a great time to really practice um good exercise habits, good eating habits. So, I mean, that can carry you on to your um, later years. Yeah. At least till 55 or 60, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Or maybe longer, right. Shades of Doc Martin. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Well, John Schaefer, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, Community Radio would like to absolutely enhance and... Um, tell you that we have been um, very impressed with the work that you've been doing all these many years. And we thank you for the service that you've given to Sacramentans because it's been just fabulous. So John Shaver, thank you. And we hope you will join us again. And maybe we will be talking about other topics. Maybe. Be yeah. happy to, Diane. Thank, thank you. you. Uh -huh. <laughs>